Welcome everyone. My name is Blake and I will be your moderator. I'm excited to welcome periodontist Dr. David Wong and general practitioner Dr. Clint Stevens for a joint session on interdisciplinary cases involving implants, orthodontics, soft tissue grafting, and more. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box labeled, have a question. This webinar is sponsored by Plan Mecca. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're talking digital workflows and best practices tonight and talking about uh, not only GP cases, but working uh, with specialists, not only from the GPN, but from the specialist in. My name is Clint Stevens. I'm a general dentist in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I've got the, the great privilege to present tonight with my good friend and periodontist, uh, David Wong. Hey, this is great. This is a, a rare opportunity for, for uh, you and I to work together. I know we've kind of worked together a lot on patients throughout the, the through over several years now, over, over a decade. And it's neat to see uh, how we've evolved and now we get to share it uh, together for Henry Schein. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, so David and I have known each other for for a while, and David's been a great mentor for me. In fact, was uh, instrumental in me starting to place implants in my practice. So you can see on the left, uh, that was already a few years ago. Unfortunately, I'm not nearly that skinny or that young anymore. And uh, yeah, you can see us today. So we've been been practicing for a while, like like David said. And so tonight, I think the first thing we'd like to talk about uh, is just our evolutionary path in digital workflows where we started and sort of how that progression has taken place over time and obviously talking today about all the great opportunities that we have uh, with digital technologies to manage interdisciplinary care. David, do you want to talk about this? Case? Yeah, you know, I, will I will talk about this one just because, you know, there's so much talk nowadays about, you know, restoratively driven implant placement, right? You hear that a lot, or even aesthetically driven implant placement. And then you'll hear on the on the other side of the coin, you know, surgeons are saying you can only put the implant where the where the bone is. So, you know, one, one of the things that the first things that we attempted to do, you know, between perio oral surgery and restorative dentists was to try to go more towards, you know, some type of guided surgery. That way the restorative dentist could help, you know, at, help address, you know, some of these malpositioned implant issues that we were having, you know, way back when. So I've been in practice almost 20 years. And so I, I've kind of lived through this, this uh, evolution here. So this is a case, you know, that, that I wanted to share with you because one of the, earlier on, when a dentist wanted to, to, to show you or tell you where the implant should be placed, they would make you a guide. And and the ongoing joke with surgeons was, yeah, you can make me a guide and I'm just going to try it in and then throw it away. And, and this was a classic reason why that would be is because back before we had CBCTs that were readily available, dentists would, would do a diagnostic wax up and then just do a suck down of the diagnostic wax up and then drill a hole, you know, where they were in the model where they wanted the implant. And then, of course, as the surgeons, we would we would reflect a flap and put the put the guide in place and then you know just for just a humor you know our restorative dentist we would we would at least make the first drill uh, through the hole that they made and as you can see here on that lower right side of your screen you know that's exactly what I did you know I, I reflected the flap and there's a there's plenty of bone there, there's no question there's absolutely plenty of bone there's a huge target there but you know my referring doctor made the made the suck down this wasn't Clint's but this was a, another guy. And there, there I am, just drilling a hole straight through there. And as you can tell, you can you don't even need a guide to know that that thing is crooked, right? So we're drilling, and then of course, you know, I don't have a guide, so now we we we've, we've overcorrected, and now we're too too far to the facial, and now we now we're in a situation where, you know, what should have been a you know twenty minute implant surgery, now we're into doing additional bone grafting, and soft tissue grafting on the facial aspect. And it still doesn't look good. Fortunately, as you can tell from this gentleman's dentition, um, he has a heavily restored mouth, older gentleman. Uh, fortunately, he has a low smile line and we get away with, with it as long as we have a good ceramist and everything else. But, you know, this is the, the old days. And this, this happened, you know, people think, oh, that doesn't happen very often. 
back then it happened a lot, not only just for anterior teeth, it happened for molars. I mean, people would just do a suck down, maybe fill it with some composite or acrylic and just drill a hole and just tell your surgeon that's where it went. And then thank goodness, you know, we, we had some digital imaging and, and 3D imaging that, that uh, came after that that helped our helped us uh, work better together. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, back in the day, you only wanted to work on patients with lip lines like, like this guy because otherwise, man, uh, good luck. And David, I'm glad you mentioned molars too because when we talk about restoratively driven practices today, you know, I think primarily the, the not only for anteriors but for posteriors, man, when you start restoring implants that aren't positioned well underneath the restorative materials, especially with uh, tie base uh, supported restorations these days or other types of ceramics, we're really looking to have a lot of prosthetic complications over time now if we're not getting these implants in the right place. And so while you'd think any reasonable surgeon could do a decent job, and I'm sure when these implants were placed, for example, they probably looked pretty good when they put them in. But man, uh, a few millimeters here or there or, or a little difference in angulation can can make a difference uh, in, in every case, even a slam dunk, lower molar and premolar. And I think really maybe the the biggest thing for, for me and for you is that better data and, and better and more control over our cases is going to lead to fewer complications over time and, and fewer headaches and, and heartburn. And it's not to say that we haven't been doing this stuff for a long time uh, successfully, like this case um, that these implants were placed in the 90s. Uh, these are still in function today. In fact, I just saw this patient on recall uh, this last week. And so it's not to say that we haven't been successful in eyeballing stuff for for years, but if you look and see where that back implant is, it's literally hanging yeah, through, to the length the of the entire mandible. How this thing has survived for 30 years 30 now, years plus, hey yeah. man, I have no idea, but I can guarantee you that the vast majority of the times, uh, misses like this are not going to be around 30 years later. I mean, this is a really good example anyway, of just, just the resilience of, of the human body. I mean, besides implants, I mean, you, if you look at just this case in general, you have implants splinted together. You have implants bridged to a natural tooth. You have a natural tooth that has a really, really wide prepped, you know, root canal. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that we do in dentistry that we get, a, get away with. And, and I, like you just said, we're not here trying to trying to be perfect every single time, but you know, when, while we have the tools today to to do a better job, it's really incumbent upon upon us to to do a better job and, and to try to minimize those complications. Which I want to you know, revisit that here here in a bit as to what you know, how do we define a complication uh, when it comes to implants. You know, so when we first started working together digitally. I had some digital technology in my office, not a lot. David, I think you were the same. And a lot of what we were farming out was pretty much everything. So in this case, which we did now years ago, the patient had to get a CBCT, which was not taken at our offices. It was taken right. in, a, in a imaging center. But that should be addressed uh, too, right? I mean, why, why were we using so many imaging centers back then, right? You know, they were, the early CBCTs were, they were, number one, they were really cost prohibitive for the amount that we would use them. Yeah. And I, and I think before we get into this case, I think it's really important because whenever I do my teaching, you know, I'll ask the audience to raise their hand if they use CBCTs in their office and they'll all raise their hands. And I'm, and I'll say, you know, let me, let me say it again. If you use CBCTs, meaning do you do more than just take a CBCT and look at it and evaluate if you have enough bone, what do you do after that? I mean, and, if you go, are you utilizing that CBCT to, to make a surgical guide, then the hands start coming down, right? Because they're like, oh, well, I'm not doing that yet. I'm just looking at it, you know, or I'm just ordering it. Okay, the patient has enough bone, it's go time. But they're still not utilizing, you know, what that CBCT can do. So um, this case you're about to show is something you and I, you know, partnered up on uh, several years ago as well. And I think it was it was a really neat case to highlight not only taking a CBCT, but actually using it. Yeah. Okay, so 
for sure. I'll let you take it from here. Well, and I think you're right too that that a lot of the older CBC technologies were expensive and in, in utilization factor in the practice, even just for the imaging side, was uh, relatively low compared to today, where we've got great imaging technology, great algorithms, and, and you can really better software. Yeah, the, you can really use that image for a lot of things, um, including tying it to treatment execution in, in the final outcome. Uh, for this case, we really didn't have any of the toys in our office, and so we used a lot of uh, third parties to get this case done, so it took a while, too. I mean, this case probably took uh, six weeks at the time for us to get every all the parts and pieces in place. Things are faster uh, now. Yeah, yeah, she came in with the number eight that was uh, she felt like was trying to push itself out of her mouth and had had previous trauma, obviously, as a young lady and root canal therapy a couple of times, and this this tooth was finally giving it up. So as you can see, even just in the pre-op, hey, we already know that we're going to have a soft tissue deficit there, and we're hoping then that we could plan some treatment for her, uh, which in this case was an immediate implant combined with providing the final custom abutment and uh, soft tissue grafting uh, all at once. Yeah. Uh, but because we used third parties, like I said, for us to get the, we got the scan done somewhere else. We had a third party help us to make the guide, make the guide, plan where the implant was going to go, manufacture, design and manufacture the abutment. And so it, it really took quite a bit of time. And keep in mind too, CBCT's machines, you know, were, were way more available than than digital scanners. You know, would you not agree? Like back then, like more people had a CBCT or at least access to one than they probably had scanners back then. So what it, what ended up happening a lot of times is is you know that that was the problem is we would just look at the bone and, and make a guide. We didn't really get a chance to so the. The impressions that we would send in to, to get the guides made. And you're going to talk about accuracy here in a second. You know, we took them on just regular alginate impressions and that we yeah. would scan the we would scan the models, right? Because we didn't have digital scanners, uh, or at least not specialist office at, at the time. But you know, the nuances to this case, just to kind of do a little extra surgery teaching here, is, is when we look at these cases for immediate implants or not, let's just kind of give a little little bit of background on why we chose an immediate implant. It's a, it's a square shaped tooth and, and we have relatively short papillas. So this is a good case to do a, an immediate implant. She also had a, a facial plate, even though the, the tooth was hopeless, she at least still had a, a facial plate to work with. So there was no worry there about safety or, or uh, causing a, a worse hard soft tissue defect. The uh, two millimeter of recession that was easily addressed and we'll, we'll talk about that next. So after the implant is is made, that's the other thing that you're gonna notice with this type of an implant surgical guide is the implant is actually placed through the guide. Some people, myself included sometimes, will actually take the guide off and still input the implant in freehand, which you can do depending on the, your implant um, design. But this one, you, you'll notice we were able to utilize the full function of that CBCT to, to place that implant through the guide and not freehand. And then Dr. Stevens over here actually made the provisional restoration. I didn't have to do it, thank God, because I'm a, I'm a terrible restorative dentist. But we were able to, to put that implant in a position because he helped me plan this. So the implant's going to go to the lingual side coming out the cingulum so that we have a screw retained uh, temporary uh, crown. So that, that was a nice little service that, that he provided to me as well as the patient. So the next slide to address the two millimeters of recession, we were able to, you know, to uh, just place a basic soft tissue graft using cadaver tissue. Uh, this did not have to come from the roof of her mouth, fortunately, for such a small defect. You'll notice, you know, right now, you know, looking at her, she looks like she has a, a relatively thick biotype. So these are all some things that we we were able to, you know, troubleshoot before we ever touched her, so we could know, you know anticipate what kind of outcome we we could expect. So here's a here's a soft tissue allograft, and then there's the uh, these. Uh, Dr. Stevens putting the yeah, that, final abutment on. Look at that. That radiograph was the day of surgery. So with the final custom abutment already in place, in fact, if anything, we got uh, in three months, then that, that tissue margin was almost a little bit too good. You know, we got 
get more tissue than we needed, which in these types of cases, man, I'd always love to have a little too much than not enough. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a great thing for this patient and uh, really exciting to be able to do it. But it was pretty arduous one because we were still having to use third parties for almost everything. And two, to your point, you know, back in the day with scanners, even if you had a scanner, a lot of times you might not have uh, that data available to be able to go outside of the ecosystem, you know. So depending on what implant systems you wanted to use or what CBCT you're using and these sorts of things, it would limit your choices relative to what you could do for your patient. Yeah. I think one of the things that you and I both like about, said the plan mecha equipment we're using today is that it's totally open relative to architecture, which means that we can plug and play and use whatever systems we want and not be limited by the manufacturer relative to the workflows that we want to use. I think that's really important, you know, to have an open system so that, you know, not only can, can you work between, you know, companies, but it's also important to be able to work with an, another specialist or another dentist that may not use the exact same platforms. You and I are unique in that we both use Plan Mecca products. I've got, you know, Plan Mecca CBCT. We both have, you know, emerald scanners and things like that. So, so we're good. But what happens when we work with other people? And so it's nice to have an open system. But take that even back farther, though. You know, what were the old scanners dependent on? It was that stupid powder, you know? So, I mean, you can't scan. It's, it's hard to, you know, you just did surgery. You can't start spraying powder and trying to scan somebody's socket and yeah. flap open. You know, it just didn't work. So I think you know, this, this is a neat position that we're in to be able to live through this whole evolution. So now that there's no powder, you can do so many different creative things like, you know, like you're showing us here. So um, this is, that was good. That was a tough case. I know you, you mentioned, of course, I love looking at the literature for things. And I know you talked about whether the implant goes through the guide or not, or what, what is, a, how accurate is the static guide and, and how to use it? Well, we know that that even if you use a guide, of course, there are things that can contribute to having things not be exactly perfect. But, man, we know that guides, and they have been for a while, and they continue to be extremely accurate for placement with with a pretty uh, low variance of, of accuracy. And we definitely have uh, tons of data to say that no matter how good you think you are, uh, you're not as good as... A guided case and we know that doing a fully guided case is absolutely the best outcome relative to translating your plan into the final solution for sure so when we talk about surgical guides for implant placement there's really just two basic types of guides right there's static and there's dynamic right so for intensive purposes of today we're talking about static guides it's something that you know made out of acrylic you're putting it in the patient's mouth and drilling and drilling through the through the uh, prepared site. Now you mentioned accuracy. You know what? What would lead a static guide to be inaccurate? Well, so obviously you're putting data into the system, so you need a good quality intraoral scan, and you need a good quality CBCT scan, and then you have to get those data sets to merge together in an accurate way. And so, uh, and and that's for for starters, right? And then you have other things too. The way you design your guide, the way you fabricate that guide, the systems you use, the tolerances between the uh, guided kit, guided surgery kit that you're using and the sleeves, the, the tolerances between those manufactured parts can be different. And there's all these little things that go, but if you start with bad data, it's you can't improve that, right? Just, you, just you, get, magnified. Uh, you gotta start with good data, good scans, good CBCT, and then then go from there for sure. Okay. Um, and two, uh, like this review article that talks about partially guided, free-handed, and, and static. So partially guided would be, say, if you used a pilot guide or you did a couple of guide, drills through the guide and then you placed an implant. Yeah. But anybody who's placed enough implants know that things like to go the path of least resistance, right? That's one of the first things you taught me when we were placing implants. And and so even if you've got a nice osteotomy, that implant can still drift uh, out of position on you as you're placing it. And of course, that doesn't even begin to talk about when we're looking at immediate 
implant placement following tooth extraction, right? Right. So that's where really then placing an implant through the guide is is really the, the optimal outcome. And that's really where we've gotten to today with leveraging today's technology and really our profession has digitized and we're getting better control and better outcomes than we than we ever have before. And, and all of that data connection, whether we're talking about the data we acquire or the way that we communicate, which we'll talk to communication here much more heavily in a minute, but when we talk about the way that we transfer data, every implant restorative case that we do today is digitally fabricated, right? There's so, some element of, of digital dentistry. It's, it's digital sure. every time. So yeah. by starting with a digital scan or starting with digital data, and the, the fewer times we cross over that digital analog divide, right. the fewer times we have opportunities to introduce errors, right? And at the same time, we know that dentists and patients all prefer digital workflows when we start talking about fabricating things. And we know that we get as good or better outcomes uh, driving these uh, solutions digitally than we do in an analog outcome. Yeah. Uh, is, is that your, what's your experience with that, Dave? No, I, I 100% agree. So I can tell you as a specialist, you know, when we first made surgical guides, I did not have a scanner. You know, I had a CBCT machine before I had a scanner. And I would bet that's probably true of most periodontists and oral surgeons. I mean, I would, I would probably bet money on that. So the challenge, the reason I asked you about the accuracy of, of the guide, you said it really depends on your on your good set of data. Here's the problem. Our first set of data that we introduced to the CBCT was literally a PBS impression material, a, a PBS impression, and then our staff would pour it up, right? And we and then you set it on the table and you break, you know, break the, the impression, whatever. And then and then you then you place it on the CBCT platform and you scan you scan your stone model of the impression that your assistant took by hand. Yeah. You know, so right off the bat, there's that error and you don't know yeah. if it's good or not. Now the checks, the check here is that we use a third party to make the guide. So they would superimpose that, that model over the CBCT to see if it was accurate. But here's the problem again is like you said, you have built in tolerances of what you, uh, what you are willing to be, what, what is negotiable, you know, are you, are you okay with a miller, millimeter here and there, like you said? And for a big fat molar, maybe you are. But what if it's a congenitally missing lateral incisor and you have five and a half millimeters? Yeah, you, you know, zero fudge factor. Yeah, there. no fudge factor. So, yeah. so nowadays that we, that you and I, you taught me this is, is the digital scanners for the for the digital impressions. Now we have less error on the front end. So if there is anything that's going to get magnified, we're not. Not, we're not creating a, a, a large, uh, a large error at the end because we screwed up in the beginning. So, yeah, and I think that's really cool because now, well, and this is just an example of a what I think you'd consider a slam dunk case. But this type of control you can have anywhere in the mouth, and that's where we can actually take the planning of a case, in this case, an upper right first molar, and we can prosthetically plan exactly where we want the tooth, put the implant right where we want it, and and we can absolutely then translate that outcome uh, directly into the patient's mouth, even fabricating a custom healing abutment or whatever you'd like to do on the top of that, that at the time the surgery can go in, hey, everything's planned beforehand, you know exactly what you're gonna get, where it's gonna go, and, and we can get that with uh, uh, an amazing amount of accuracy these days and then develop things however we want. I mean, we're, we're able now to generate outcomes and shapes and things uh, all planned ahead of time and translate that into the patient's outcome uh, just seamlessly. I think it's awesome. I mean, you said this is slam dunk, but in, in my view, I mean, this this is really neat because it, it actually legitimately solves a periodontal problem, you know, from my perspective. You know, if, so for example, if you're replacing this molar here, um, 
or even a big premolar. You know, one of the problems we had with the restorative side of it was the classic tomato on a stick, you know, look here, right? And now with with little additional cost, if any, maybe less cost, probably. Two, two bucks, who knows? Yeah. So, so, it's, so it's less cost. You can already pre-design a custom healing abutment for less cost than what the manufacturer would charge you for a standard healing abutment. Rather than it just being a generic little circle, you know, you have something that's customized you know, to that patient's periodontium so that at the time of implant placement, you're screwing this custom healer on, which you know, also translates into a more anatomically correct final restoration that the patient can floss, doesn't get food impaction as much. So for me, I feel, I feel like it, so it solves a legit problem utilizing technology that for once in our lives costs less yeah. than the standard. For sure. Well, in, in all of this case, uh, going back to that, you know, this case all happened to be planned in, in Remexis and in PlanCAD Premium and executed. But the great thing, too, is you get so much data beforehand. So we already knew how much soft t keratinized tissue I had over this site before we even started. So if, if I found out that I didn't have enough keratinized tissue or I needed something else, I mean, that's something then that you would already be able to anticipate that you need to address uh, at the time of surgery or as a separate surgery or that sort of thing. And so I'm with you with every everything we're doing today. It's given us a, a lot more control over uh, not only the, the restorative outcome in the hardware, but to your point also uh, controlling the periodontium and getting the healing that you want, whatever you think is is appropriate, and being sure that you have that that soft tissue architecture that you that you need. I've got another case to share, mostly because, as you said before, David, talking about using the technology, I probably use three D imaging on a daily basis to help me make decisions that. Otherwise, I would probably make the wrong decision for the patient, or I'd get in the middle of treatment and discover that I had screwed up. And of course, when when I have a, and I don't do everything in my practice. There are plenty of things uh, I don't do soft tissue management at all, uh, and I don't I don't do orthodontic treatment. And that, there's plenty of things that I don't do. Right, I place implants, but but I don't do every implant. And so, for example, when a case like this comes in and the patients touching above, you know, just right below their nose. And they said, hey, doc, it just sort of, it just sort of sore up here. I don't know what's going on. And you take this radiograph, I have the benefit of knowing the history on this case because this patient has been in my practice for, for 30 years. And so I haven't been practicing for 30 years, even hopefully you don't think I look like that. But anyway, um, this patient came in in 1965, he had an ice skating accident, lost a tooth, uh, had some endo and crown work done, and then my predecessor actually did some reworking of this in the early 2000s. So when this patient came in and said it was sore up above the end of that root, man, the last thing I wanted to do was to get into having to restore this case or mess with this tooth because we all know that this could head to a bad place pretty quickly. What I was sort of hoping is that I was just going to maybe farm them out to my endodontist buddy for a quick apicoectomy and kick the can down the road. But thanks to 3D imaging, I quickly discovered that that wasn't the case. You know, so if I took a look at this case in 2D, hey, then I'm sending this case immediately then to in in if I didn't get 3D and I just took 2D and I looked at this one, I'd be looking at this thinking, man, I hope that we don't have to do anything other than an apico and I would have kicked him out to the specialist. At two, I would be looking at that bony defect next to that tooth thinking, man, if that tooth does have to come out, we're fixing to have a huge defect up here and I'm gonna have to kick this out to one of my surgeons to do some significant GBR or that sort of thing. Actually, though, looking at it in 3D, hey, I quickly discover one, endodontist ain't going to be able to help me because this tooth is fractured right at the end of that post, and we've got a, a significant lesion there. But the other interesting thing is that huge defect in 2D, hey, it turns out that's just his... Uh, Anatomy. Yeah, it's just his... Uh, that's the, 
uh, not the Panama Canal, but it sort of looks like it's pretty yeah, big. It's pretty wide. But it turns out, since we didn't know how the um, tooth that was coming out was going to heal, hey, we ended up uh, treatment planning an implant in bone where I had plenty of adequate bone for an implant there and doing a cantilever restoration and was able to to successfully uh, take the other tooth out, graft, restore, get an implant in. All of all of this decision making, the the patient was involved in, but two, without the technology at hand, man, I would have had no idea, or I would have burned out a lot of my colleagues' time just chasing our trail, trying to figure out what to do with this that I didn't have to do because I had the technology in house. Right. I think that that's the key thing too. I mean, that's just as important, even though you're not doing anything with it. It was really important to to help, you know, understand, you know, what you have here, help nail down that diagnosis. Because the last thing anybody wants to do, like we have the benefit of living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where everything's 15 minutes away. But if you're in a bigger city and you got to drive, you know, 45 minutes to the endodontist and then he sends you to the periodontist and then it goes back to the restorative dentist. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, it just turns out it's just your, you know, nasal palatine canal. We can actually dodge that. They're going to be like, you idiot, right? Yeah, like just you just spent, sent me all over the place. Just I spent six hundred bucks and how yeah. long in a car? Yeah, yeah, just, just for something that, that a, a, a CVCT could have showed us. So, yeah, that's that's a great that's a great example. So let's do some more multidisciplinary stuff with with digital. Yeah, here here's a case that I definitely uh, had to get my guys involved. So in this case, we had a patient who had existing PFM crowns, of course. Any dentist can look at those and know that those have been in the mouth a pretty good amount of time. This patient has soft tissue defects or deficits, I should say. And if you look at the lower occlusion, you can't see it in the in the clinical photo, but I've got a just a picture of the, the scanned in dentition there. And this patient is telling me that she can't stand to have these PFMs in her mouth another minute. Right, they have to come out. She knows that we need to fix the alignment of her teeth, and she knows that she has uh, issues with her gum tissue, but she just can't live another day. I'm sure you've all had a patient like this where <laughs> doesn't matter how rational you are, hey, this is, this is, she had to get it out. Oh, and what else did she need, David? She had to be sedated, right? Because she couldn't right. stand the thought of me drilling through all of that stuff and her being awake. Right. So this is where digital technology uh, saved our bacon in, in more than one way. One, it helped me to go ahead and communicate with David about how we're going to manage soft tissue, what he would need to get that done. Also, I'm, if the patient needs these crowns off, man, I am super worried that if I do replacement dentistry on the upper arch, but we don't address the occlusion on the lower, that we're going to set this patient up for, for failure of that restorative treatment early. But she's not willing to do the, she's, she's willing to do orthodontic treatment, but she's not willing to do it before she gets those crowns off of there. So in this case, then I can also share the digital data with my orthodontist. And he was able to go ahead and digitally treatment plan her case and provide me with STLs of where he was going to finish the case on the lower within a reasonable range. So now we can take this digital data and actually treatment plan the case from start to finish before we ever touch the patient. As part of that, pulled her into PlanCat Premium, did a mock-up. She wanted to preserve some of her asymmetries and these things in her in her crowns and really just wanted to get rid of black lines and spruce things up. And so we were able to put this in the face, do a mock-up, share with the patient, do a mock-up try-in, so we know before she goes under, hey, that she's going to be happy with the final result. And I was able to use that adjusted lower final model to build to, to be sure that whatever we put in her mouth is going to do well when we finally get the ortho done. So then we actually brought her in to David's office. I hate cooking in somebody else's kitchen, but oh, it's hard. Ca came over for the afternoon. Uh, anesthesiologist knocked her out. And then 
I went to town cutting off a bunch of crowns. David did some soft tissue grafting on the upper and we left her in provisionals for three months. I was thinking I'd get a chance to touch some things up and do some other things. And, and she didn't let me do any of that. She said, I want to go to finals. I love the, the temps, make it like the temps. And so hey, we kept some asymmetries in there and gave her what, what she wanted and she was tickled pink with it. And uh, this is an immediate post-op delivery of her crowns before ortho, but she did eventually get the ortho done and we did get everything leveled and aligned as well with that case. But because of being able to use the, the digital tools that we had with digital scans, with CBCT, and with advanced software for spinal design, in this case, Plain Care Premium, and we were able to go start to finish no surprises on anybody's end. Uh, we knew where we were starting, knew where we were ending, and the patient did too. And I think a lot of times that's the most important part, right? If you can't communicate it to the patient and then translate it into the final result, that's really where we have a lot of issues. I think, you know, this new technology that, that we're using with Plan Mecca is, is so cool for, because a lot of times people think, you know, they'll see one of your presentations or one of my presentations they're like i can't do all that or how am i going to implement all that the neat thing about it is you can use this technology for even basic stuff like if you back up to your your first photos of this case here i mean one of the biggest things is like is clinical photography right you know how many people struggle with clinical photography they just don't like it like for example that's my picture that i sent to you uh, but the next picture look at the next one that's your scanner you know and i'm like because what, what's not readily available or, or a skill set for a lot of dentists is the ability to take good pictures. You know, either they don't have the right equipment or they have, you know, this fancy camera that they don't, don't know how to use or they, their assistants don't know how to use. But look how clear the, the scanners are nowadays. I mean, it looks as good as a picture as far as patients are concerned. And you can utilize this to, to communicate because otherwise, if, they're not, if dentists aren't using this, what are they using? They're using that, that intraoral camera which is horrible, right? It, it gives you like a zoomed up shot of like a cusp and they have no idea what you're trying to say. But this is so cool for people who don't take clinical photography to be able to communicate to their patient what, what you're trying to do for them. And also, you know, because you're speaking to me, the orthodontist, yourself, the patient, all four of us are looking at this and going, I can, I get it. You know what I mean? I, I totally get it. You can, I, I see what you're trying to do. I, you're, you're able to share your vision and we can all see it. So, you know, let's talk about the, the next item here, which is the, the state of our profession. Yeah, so really, when we talk about the state of the profession today, it's digitizing whether you like it or not. And a lot of our perception of, of how good digital technology is, is probably pretty behind the times. And especially when we look at published data, you know, anytime data has been published, it's already obsolete, especially in this area of our profession today. It changes all the time. Oh, man, it's changing so quickly that if you're seeing it in print, hey, it's already out of date, right? But if we look at now old data, this is three years old. So uh, multiple manufacturers have made significant improvements in their technology over the last uh, three years. But... If you look at this group where this was a fascinating study, in fact, this is probably the most uh, closest to reality study there is because these uh, folks took a maxilla out of somebody's head uh, and scanned it in with a very accurate uh, industrial scanner and then uh, used a bunch of different scanners to scan in this maxilla and found that there were really no significant differences between PVS impressions and several digital scanners in this study. So we already, we've held PVS on a pedestal forever, right? But I would say that if anything, uh, making PVS impression on an inanimate maxilla is a lot easier than doing it on a live human being. 
Meanwhile, I don't know that there's a lot of differences between scanning in the maxilla, whether it's in your head or or there. Uh, but in any case, we know that all of these scanners are getting just more accurate all the time. Some of that has to do with hardware changes. So even just on this graph, and again, this graph's already obsolete, but if you look at changes, say, between Omnicam and Prime Scan, or between Emerald and Emerald S, hey, these types of, or Itero elements in the, in the elements too, those jumps were due because of hardware changes, right? But then if you look at other things, uh, just the change between Meta HD or say the Emerald S beta and production, hey, all of those changes are just software. That means you leave your office one day and come in the next day and get a software update, and all of a sudden your scanner is significantly more accurate than it was the day before. This is really where digital is growing in leaps and bounds, and, and a lot of manufacturers are doing uh, a great job. And if you ask yourself where PBS is on this bar chart, hey, it's it's way up there. This, there's several scanners on the market today that are absolutely more accurate than PBS impression material. And that's also true with soft tissue. This has probably been our Achilles heel when we talk about digital scanning, which is a fully edentulist patient. At this point, really what we're saying is that several scanners uh, today, including like the Emerald S that I'm using, are actually just as accurate as a physical impression for soft tissues. The caveat though is that we all know that physical impressions compress the tissue a certain amount and the the direction of error for scanners seems to be in the opposite direction, but about of the same magnitude, right? So they're, they're equally inaccurate, I guess you could say. Of course, the one thing that we still can't do is capture borders and these sorts of things. So if you think that, that functional border molding and some of these things are important, obviously we haven't figured out how to do that with a scanner. But otherwise, if we're talking about fixed hybrids and some other things, man, there's almost all of our workflows today, you can capture that data is good or better with a scanner than you can with a physical impression. Absolutely. I mean, what do you say to people who's, who, you know, we even have digital articulators now, you know? Sure. Well, uh, interestingly, you could uh, actually probably, I mean, you could go in and stitch uh, an STL file. You could stitch a, a model to a CBCT scan and you could actually go in and measure the patient's actual condylar inclination on the CBCT and right. put those figures into the digital articulator. And of course, it's the most, it's the closest thing to replicating a human Absolutely. being. And now with some of the jaw tracking software and other things coming out, um, and it, it, we will absolutely have the digital patient in a virtual articulator will be more representative of reality than a fully adjustable or semi-adjustable articulator on a bench top ever was. Yeah, I just bring that up because there's that that's one thing that people are like, I don't want to go digital impressions because I, I need to have that articulator and hold it in my hand and, and articulate, you know, and I'm just like, you know, t times are changing. Well, you know, you got a three-year-old that needs to get rid of a binky too. Hey, sometimes you just got to take it away. <laughs> you know, take it away. Uh, and of course, then when we talk about 3D data, I think for the reason that you and I didn't have 3D 15 years ago was because, man, these units were expensive. Uh, the utilization factor for the practice, even in a practice like yours, uh, utilization was perhaps not super high. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that, sure, you could eyeball a scan, but if you're not fabricating a guide or actually doing anything with it, well, man, that's not particularly useful, you right. know. You just have a toy. Yeah. yeah. And I think, too, we were concerned about radiation. I mean, the question is, if you have a number 19 and you know you got plenty of bone, and again, that's my version of a slam dunk case, is it really worth exposing the patient to the radiation? Is it worth the cost, extra cost, the extra time, and, and whatever. Well, at least for some manufacturers, and these numbers are specific to Plan Mecca, when we're looking at advanced 2D imaging today on one of their machines as opposed to an internal sensor, man, 
we're knocking radiation down to almost nothing. You know, so so we've got uh, just comparing uh, four panoramic bite wings to a regular series of bite wings, and four microceiverts is is nothing. And the fascinating thing is that thanks to high quality hardware combined with software, man, now with ultra low dose protocols, for example, with this uh, happens to be from from Plan Mecca's uh, unit, and they're getting ultra low dose. Uh, exposures that are less than a pant sometimes. I mean, this is unbelievable. So the concern about radiation exposure that we used to have, I think, is not there anymore. Combined with the fact that with software and access to uh, mills and printers and other things today, man, we can turn the utilization factor up uh, a thousand percent in practices. And, and at the same time, and the cost for buying a 3D unit has never been lower. I mean, it's amazing uh, how inexpensive it is. So bang for your buck is is almost a, a no brainer at this point. So right now we've got we've got the, the digital technology is is more accurate. Yeah, the costs are coming down and it's safe. So what is to keep people from implementing the technology? And I think that's uh, really the elephant in the room, right? Because you, we're running out of excuses now right. for implementing technology because we know that, one, costs are coming way down. Two, utilization is through the roof. Three, everything that we're doing is digital. And, and also, there's no better way to connect your diagnostics with your treatment plan, with the execution of the treatment, in the the facilitation of the final solution, there's there's no way that you can connect those in an analog world like you can in the digital world. This is the the most predictable um, way to do dentistry, but it's it's pretty uh, daunting sometimes. I think for offices to consider uh, digitizing. I think, you know, for me, just, you know, since I'm not a restorative dentist, but I work with you know, over 200 of them, you know, whenever I ask them the question, I think that the common thing for me is, has always been, been cost. And, and now that it's coming down, I think it helps some of them, but, you know, I think the biggest challenge is that, is that they don't, sometimes it's a lack of perceived need. They're like, well, I'm already a good dentist or I'm a, or I just send all that off to a specialist. I don't need that stuff. Um, what do you say to that? You know, when people, people are like, I don't need that. I'll, my specialist has it. I, therefore, I don't need it. Well, I think any time that you're making a change in your practice, you're doing it for one of a couple of reasons, right? You're doing it either because it improves practice economics. That's a possibility. That's a good reason. Right? Uh, it improves patient outcomes. Yeah. That's obviously should probably be the the main driver of our decision-making practice in our profession. And then I think the the third thing that gets overlooked sometimes is uh, just the convenience factor, right? I mean, anything you can do to make your life easier in your practice uh, gives you bandwidth to do other things, yep. right? And so when you look at just basic nuts and bolts, so if we look at it, implementing 3D technology or enteral scanners, which I think are the, the low hanging fruit options of today's world. Uh, with either of those, had the learning curve that was pretty daunting before, I think has been drastically reduced thanks to better, better hardware and better software today. Uh, to the point where anybody could implement those into their office in a short period of time and absolutely improve the efficiency and cost effectiveness of what they're doing, you're going to get at least as good of outcomes for your patients, if not better. Uh, and your hassle factor after that initial uh, implementation period is going to go actually way down. It's not, it's not going to be there to complicate your life. It's actually going to be there to make it easier and better. Yeah, I agree. I want to end with one story. So we, we had a patient, um, 
that when it was going through ortho and as you know orthodontists are pretty much all digital impressions now and it just so happened you know what happened is she over the weekend she broke her tooth in half and she called her office she was going to do it she wanted an, an immediate implant she wanted immediate tooth and the problem is she lived two hours away but our buddy dr kyle shan he had a, he already had her scan because she was an ortho patient of his so from that scan open system we were able to utilize his scan to make a cbct uh, i mean in cbct to make the surgical guide had the temporary crown already done so all we had to do all she had to do was call her office make the appointment she came in took the tooth out implant went in thanks to the guide temporary was already made crown goes in done and you know to, to think in the old days how many different appointments just for diagnostics that would have taken it would have been a nightmare for her and she was able to drive in from two hours out of town to get her to the same day so for me that that sealed the deal for me i'm like i I, i'm so glad i'm on this digital train i'm so glad that you brought me on it so thank you i think it's a good time to stop this thing man yeah let's open it up to some questions